Our lecture today is going to bring us through the early part of the 15th century in Italy. And in our last lecture, we talked about where the Renaissance began, which was up in the city of Padua, which is just inland from Venice. So we have Venice kind of in the upper right-hand corner of Italy here, and Padua a few miles inland. In today's lecture, we're going to talk about the city of Florence, and Florence is down here in the Republic of Florence. So remember, during this age, Italy is divided up into a bunch of different city-states. And of course, Florence is unmistakable as far as identification is concerned. We have the great Florence Cathedral in the center, and right next to it, in the left of this image, is the Palazzo Vecchio, which is the seat of government in Florence, both of which the buildings are around 300 feet in height. Now, during the movie Medici Godfathers of the Renaissance, Dale Kent talked about what a wonderful place Florence was. She said that during the 15th century, the city of Florence was the place to be, that it was similar to what Paris would have been like in the late 19th century, or what New York would have been like in the early 20th century. So basically, if it was happening, it was gonna be happening in Florence. But it's not the rosy picture that we all paint it to be. There's still a lot of problems. We have a tax on Florence from neighboring city-states, both Milan and Naples. In fact, Milan attacks the city twice. The plague is going to visit again in 1417, and 16,000 Florentines die. This is also coinciding with the first attack on the city by Milan, and the plague kills off about half of the Milanese troops, and the Florentines believe that this was very much an act of God. We also have taxes becoming an issue in 1420, and Halley's Comet passes the Earth in 1453, causing widespread panic, and this is also the year Constantinople is going to fall to the Turks. Now, with Halley's Comet passing the Earth again in 1453, this time it's associated with major earthquakes, and they're so bad that the city of Florence, most of the people are sleeping outside because the buildings that they had constructed were collapsing. We do have some good news, though, because in 1454, the Medici family come to power, and they're able to provide a relative calm until once again they're going to be exiled from the city, and this happens in 1494. So we've got about 40 years of relative calm, which is really important in the construction of the arts. And of course, this family is important to us because they are one of the most tremendous patrons during this age. So here we are at the Florence Cathedral. And remember with the cathedral complex, it's made up of three individual buildings. The first one is the cathedral itself, which you see off to the left with the gigantic dome. And then we have more of a vertical building, um, kind of mid-right of this image. That's the bell tower, and we're familiar with like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. That is the bell tower for the Pisa uh, cathedral complex. However, in this case, the bell tower, not only is it not leaning, but it's kind of cool to know that Giotto was the one who designed this. And then in front, we have the baptistry, and we're gonna focus on that building first. So this is the baptistry, and during the 15th century, there was a commission set out to create the north doors, which are made in bronze. So a contest is held and the winner would be given the commission to create the set of north doors for the baptistry. This is a commission that would have lasted over 20 years. So this is a really important job to get. Anytime you see an object made from bronze during the Renaissance, you have to think money. If you took a statue of marble and the same size statue of bronze, it's 10 times more expensive to make that sculpture out of bronze. The project is going to be funded by the Wool Merchants Guild and Giovanni de' Medici, the father of Cosimo, he's gonna be one of the judges. 
Now, most of the books will tell you that it comes down to two individuals to get this prize. The first one is Lorenzo Ghiberti, who you see this image here, and Filippo Brunelleschi, who creates this image. And here they are together. So we've got Ghiberti's work at the left and Brunelleschi's work at the right. The scene that you're looking at is called The Sacrifice of Isaac, and it takes place in the book of Genesis. God commands Abraham to take his only son, Isaac, out into the woods and sacrifice him. Along with Abraham and Isaac, we also have two servants and a donkey. And so right before Abraham sacrifices Isaac, an angel comes down and says, this was just a test of your faith to God. So here we have the idea of divine intervention, just as death is going to be imminent, very much in the way that the plague came in and wiped out the Milanese army in 1417 as it was attacking the city of Florence. So what I'd like you to do is to pause the video for just a little bit and do a compare and contrast of these two works. Which one do you like the best? How would you describe each of these works? and we'll rejoin together in just a couple of minutes. All right, so I'll tell you that both of these artists are in their early 20s when they create these works, and also the shape of these works is very unique. The term is called quatrefoil. Now, I can tell you that when I was a student that I would have written down that Ghiberti's work at the left is very suave, it's graceful, and it's much more of a classical rendering of the bodies. In fact, that figure of Isaac on the altar there, the design below, very much like the design on the Arapacus that we saw earlier in the semester, this is the very first time we have a true Renaissance nude figure. And he's very brave. He looks up almost in deliverance from death. We have a continuous rhythm in the drapery and the bodies and the rocks. It almost looks like this work is flowing, very much like a waterfall. Now in Brunelleschi's work, I would describe this as rugged, explosive, and very much intense. When we look at Abraham, he is violently grabbing his son's neck and twisting it. And we've got this angel coming out of space physically grabbing and restraining Abraham as he's about to cut Isaac's neck. There's fear in the sun. We have more natural and human instincts and poses. And the difference is, and the person who wins the contest is the person at the left, it's Ghiberti. Now, Ghiberti wins not so much because of the scene on the front, but actually how the work is created. What we see with Ghiberti's panel is that it's created from one piece of bronze, except for that figure of Isaac. That is sculpted separately. However, with Brunelleschi's work, all of his images were sculpted separately and then placed up against the background. He used a lot more bronze. And when we're looking at money and we're concerned about budget, we're going to go with the person who is more technically capable of creating a work, and that is Ghiberti. Now, this totally pisses Brunelleschi off, and he leaves Florence for the city of Rome, where he's going to really study architecture for the next several years before returning to Florence. So these are the completed north doors, and it took Ghiberti 23 years to complete these. And of course, everyone was totally blown away by these, so they immediately give Ghiberti another commission. And that commission is for the East Doors. And in a century later, Michelangelo is going to coin these the Gates of Paradise. It took Ghiberti 27 years to complete this set of doors. So Brunelleschi does return to Florence, and he's going to be the one who builds the dome on top of the Florence Cathedral. And one of the reasons I like to show that documentary about the Medici Godfathers of the Renaissance is the computer rendering of the cathedral without the dome on the top. We're so used to seeing that, 
but during the 1400s, this really served as an embarrassment for the city. This was an unfinished building, and they were just too overly ambitious for this project. So don't forget that the secret to the dome was that there's actually two domes here, an inner dome and an outer dome, space in between that is basically a stairwell up to the top, but also certain points are open for maintenance. The Florentines wanted to create the largest dome in the Western world, and up to that point, it was this building here, the Pantheon and this is 140 feet in diameter. The Florence Cathedral is 143 and a half feet in diameter. But we're also looking at, it's gonna be a different construction material. Here, this is made out of concrete. It could have been very easily molded, but unfortunately, after the fall of the Roman Empire, the recipe for concrete was lost. So the Florentines had to find a way to create this dome on top of this building. And there were all sorts of ideas floating around that they might even fill this space with dirt and then put in gold coins at different levels so that when the time came to remove all the dirt, because that was going to be the bracing material for the dome because they didn't have enough trees to make the lumber to build a wooden uh, bracing structure, that they could have people from the city digging out the soil from the different doorways and their incentive would be to find the gold coins that had been sprinkled in. So you can go to the top of the Florence Cathedral every single day except for Sunday and it will cost you eight euros, which I think is not a good deal. They should be paying me eight euros to climb up all those steps. But once you get to the top, it is an absolutely amazing view of the city and you can also go up the bell tower as well to the roof. You do not want to slide off. There is a very good chance you will be killed. And if you are a video game fan uh, and you play Assassin's Creed, your character can slide off the uh, Florence Cathedral ceiling uh, and down the dome. Your character does die, so make sure to save your game before you do this. But you can see even in the video game how perfectly it's rendered, just like it is in real life. Now the lantern, that comes later. And one of the, there's several things about the documentary I showed you that bother me. Number one, they'll always show this with the completed lantern. That's not going to happen for another 30 to 40 years after the dome is completed. And also they show Cosimo de' Medici looking up and seeing this beautiful paintings of the interior of the dome. This does not happen for about another 150 years after the dome is completed, well out of Cosimo's uh, existence. And the last thing during the documentary, they play Hallelujah. That isn't even written until the 1600s. So there is uh, a little bit of false information in that documentary. Now, Filippo Brunelleschi, we had no idea where he was buried, but when there was construction done in the catacombs uh, underneath the cathedral in 1978, they found his remains and they were reburied at the Florence Cathedral. Brunelleschi also created the Hospital of the Innocents, the Ospedale Degla Innocente, which is not a hospital for treating sick people, but it is an orphanage and it is created or funded by the largest guild in Florence, making sure that they were taking care of the population that was the most vulnerable, the population that was in need the most. Now, also when you were taken here as an orphan, you would be given room and food, uh, education, all the way until you were 18, and you were also given, you would assume the last name, uh, Innocente. A lot of people in Italy have this last name today and you can trace their lineage back to this building. What's exciting about this structure is that first, it's the very first building made with a blueprint. 
And the reason that a blueprint had to be used was Brunelleschi could not be here on the job site all that often. This was being built at the same time as the dome on the Florence Cathedral. That was a much more important project, and that's where Brunelleschi was. So he left notes and blueprints of how to construct this building. This is also, for the first time in a thousand years, a Roman building being built in Italy. And we can see that from the Corinthian columns. We can see that from the arches, the triangles above the window, the pediments. This is a Roman structure. And remember that after he lost to Ghiberti for the Bronze Door Commission, he went to Rome proper and studied these ancient remains of the Roman civilization. We also have these infant medallions created later after the building has been constructed. They are made out of terracotta and they are in memoriam to the children that King Herod had killed. So now I want to shift gears a little bit. I don't want to lose sight of Brunelleschi quite yet, but I want to talk about the way that imagery was created. We've talked about architecture already, but I want to move into painting. When you hear the term pictorial plane or picture plane, this term refers to the surface of a canvas or panel, some type of two-dimensional surface used in creating art. And also during this time period, we have a character by the name of Leon Battista Alberti, who publishes a book that's still in print today. In fact, here's a copy of it as one of the Penguin Classics and it's called On Painting. And in this book, Alberti states that looking at a painting should be the same as looking out a window, which as an artist, it could really upset you because of course, a piece of canvas or wood panel is two dimensional and looking out at a scene out a window is three dimensional. And so Alberti is asking us to do the impossible. So we've come up with six illusionary techniques that we use to quote unquote, pierce the pictorial plane. So these techniques are scale, overlapping, vertical location, and all those are real easy. We've been doing all those since kindergarten. But when we add the term perspective in, the material becomes a lot more complex, but also a lot more realistic. And we're gonna talk about atmospheric perspective, amplified perspective, which is really better known as for shortening, and linear perspective. So we'll start with scale. And in scale, it states that objects closer to us appear larger than those that are farther away. When we look at a painting like this, we can see that line of trees on the left-hand side of the painting kind of diminishing in size as it leads us back down the snow-covered roadway even though all those trees are physically the same distance from me because they're on a flat piece of canvas, because of the altering of scale, it makes it look like the figures here are three-dimensional, that they recede into this unknown space. And this is exactly what happens in real life. And what artists try to do is capture the way our eyes see, which is not always correct but they mimic the way we see and make the artwork look three-dimensional. So these are some of my past students, Ibrahim at the left, and then Rebecca and Serene, and honestly, I don't remember the girl at the back, I'm sorry, but we can see how they diminish in size because of the variance of scale. So then we're gonna to go to overlapping. Here, objects closer to us cover or hide objects that are farther away. And so in this painting here, we've got on the left-hand side this bottle of apple juice covering up part of a water bottle. And on the right-hand side, we have that distinctive bottle of Perrier covering up another bottle behind that. So this is where we have overlapping. With vertical location, the higher an object is placed, the farther away it is from us. 
in irises here, we've got this wonderful Japanese screen. And we can see that the irises have different ground levels that they're sitting on. Some look like they're kind of floating near the top of the canvas, but it's the idea that we're looking at this landscape. The higher the object is, the further back or further recessed it is. This is a much more contemporary artwork done during the pop art era, but it portrays the same idea of vertical location. Those cans of coffee and that roast that is closest to us, further back and further higher up in the canvas are the soda and beer and camera. And then higher up yet is that lemon and apple sitting on the windowsill. So the higher an object is, the further back it is. And again, it's done in this painting here where we've got the apple juice sitting below the level of the canvas. Then we've got the orange soda and finally the Martinelli's grape soda at the very center, highest on the canvas for this back from us. So now we start adding that term perspective in. And I don't want you to get too caught up into the definitions. It's mostly important that you kind of understand the idea behind this, that you're able to look at a work of art and go, yeah, that's in atmospheric perspective. So this is kind of a more technical definition that states as forms recede into the background, their contours become less distinct. Objects begin to take on the colors of the atmosphere. And this is the way we see. Here we are up in Yosemite, and look at that foreground. It's lush, it's green, it's highly defined. We can almost count the pine needles on some of these trees. But when we start to move back into these mountains that are further away from us, the colors of these mountains begin to change. The contours become less distinct. And that mountain range in the very far back distant there, that almost has this bluish color, almost like the same value or level of color that the atmosphere has. It not only happens in color, it happens in black and white. And it has to happen in paintings for them to look realistic. So again, we have a clear foreground here. As we move in the background, we go from right to left. And those mountains at the left are barely visible. They are literally the same color, the same value as the, the sky. Then we're going to go to Amplified Perspective. Now this is more commonly known as foreshortening. And here the artist is purposely reducing or distorting parts of an object, but still able to convey that illusion of three-dimensionality. I will tell you that Amplified Perspective or foreshortening is very, very rare. So the most common work we're going to see, and it's from this time period, is the Dead Christ. And Montaigne was a master at foreshortening. In this case here, what he's done is he shortened up both the legs and the torso of Christ and kind of elevated the body a little bit. Because what would happen is if this were done correctly in what we're going to learn as linear perspective, we wouldn't have been able to see the body of Christ at all because his feet would have been blocking our way. What foreshortening does is it allows us as the viewer to come in very quickly to a scene at a very odd or unique angle. I mean, what other painting can you think about that brings us in at the feet of Christ as he's laying on this marble slab? The same thing here when you are walking through this room in Florence and you look up and you've got people looking down at you from above. What a great sensation that would be. And again, this is a work by Montaigne. This is a later work from the Baroque age where this angel is literally flying into the scene from above us. And we even have her shortening in photography. Again, it's just a very odd, very unique angle that we're not used to seeing. 
And now we're going to move on to linear perspective. Linear perspective is the most convincing way of representing three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. Now we have some good news, which is linear perspective is nothing more than a math equation, which is great because a math equation is a formula that we can all follow. Unfortunately, there is some bad news too, and it's because it's a math equation, not a whole lot of us enjoy math. So I'm going to walk you through this, and it is going to be very, very simple, though. So we're going to revisit Brunelleschi, because this is the person, besides building the dome on the Florence Cathedral and the very first orphanage in Florence, he's also the one who codifies or puts a formula to linear perspective. Once it was codified, it revolutionized art and became what would be known as the gold standard that artists had to live up to, at least until 1863. When we get to modern art, and that's what begins in 1863 with this painting called Luncheon on the Grass, everyone followed the idea of linear perspective. And if you could not do linear perspective, then you really had to find another profession. It was one of those things that was mandatory for you to do as an artist. Now, the theory of linear perspective is pretty simple. It states that parallel lines appear to converge on or emerge from a single point in the distance, and that point is called the vanishing point. So imagine us being up here in Alaska on a train and we're the engineer and we're driving this train about a hundred miles an hour. Should we really trust our eyes? Because what they're telling us is that these tracks, although we know them to be parallel, look as if they're going to be meeting at a point in the distance. And that point is the vanishing point. So what do we do? Do we slam on the brakes? Or does our mind take over and just tell us that our eyes are really messed up? and we should trust our brain knowing these tracks are parallel. And it happens everywhere that we look. When we board an airplane, or we're flying down the Death Star Trench, or even going through hyperspace, parallel lines meet at a point in the distance called the vanishing point. And if you're not a Star Wars fan, that's totally okay because it happens in Star Trek as well. So the very first thing an artist does, and what we're going to be doing on our project, is to create a horizon line. That horizon line is where the land and the sky are going to meet. Keep in mind that this is an arbitrary position, meaning that the artist can place this anywhere on the canvas, and that the horizon line, even though we physically see it end at the frame or edge of the canvas, it extends infinitely in either direction past the canvas. So here's our horizon line. And again, it's just a horizontal line in space. In the case of the railroad tracks, it was up really high. In the case of this beach scene, it's pretty low. The next thing an artist is going to do is place the vanishing point. So the vanishing point is where all those parallel lines are going to meet. The vanishing point does live on the horizon line. So depending on where the vanishing point is placed, we can say the image either has frontal recession or diagonal recession. And I'll show you some images here that will better help illustrate this point. So the railroad tracks to the left, the vanishing point is in the center of the work and that's called frontal recession. The work itself is very balanced, it's very symmetrical, the left side and the right side are pretty much even. However, when we look at the railroad tracks to the right, I mean it's amazing what a difference in vanishing point will do. Having it pulled off to the right, we have a totally unique scene, totally different than the scene at the left. This is diagonal recession. And it can happen whether the vanishing point is off a little bit from the center, off a lot from the center. And remember, it doesn't even have to be on the canvas 
because the horizon line extends past the frame. All that the vanishing point has to do is live on the horizon line. So of course, this is where all the parallel lines are going to converge. If this fails to happen, that means the work is going to look weird. It's not going to be in linear perspective. So here's what we've done so far, a horizon line and a vanishing point. So all parallel lines in our work are going to be drawn in such a way that they converge on or emerge from the vanishing point. So lines that should be parallel, such as railroad tracks, are no longer going to be parallel. They're going to be angled. The very first work of linear perspective was done in this church, Santa Maria Novella, in the city of Florence. And when we walk through the nave and just off to the left of that pulpit, we have this work here. This is the Holy Trinity by Masaccio. It's around 20 feet tall to give you an idea of height. And when it was unveiled, it drew tremendous crowds, almost kind of like how the Mona Lisa does today because it was just amazing to see this artwork and primarily the barrel vault extend into space that truly didn't exist. And this is the way that we can prove an artwork is in linear perspective. It's kind of like a geometry proof and we also kind of work backwards. So if you would ask me if this work at the left was in linear perspective, the first thing I'm going to do is look for those architectural features that would have parallel lines. In this case, it's the barrel vault above the crucifixion. And if we drew a line, not on the work of art itself, but on a copy of it, we could see that the lines are not parallel, that they're angled and they meet at that single point called the vanishing point. Once we establish the vanishing point, we establish the horizon line, since the vanishing point lives on the horizon line. And we can see that the patrons of this work of art that are kind of outside the scene as onlookers are leaning on the ground line itself. So we know that we are correct. And again, this is the very first work of art done in linear perspective. Prior to linear perspective, architecture looked pretty funky. This is another painting by Giotto. And even though we revere Giotto as being this wonderful Renaissance artist, we can see that he didn't really know about linear perspective, and he shouldn't have. It was invented about 100 years after him. So we can see that from these architectural features, we have all these lines that go haphazardly to the other side of the screen, and they do not meet at a single point in the distance. So there is no vanishing point here, and this work is not in linear perspective. The Last Supper was created a hundred years after the invention of linear perspective, roughly. And with this work here, we can definitely say that it is in perspective for several reasons. Number one, after the invention of linear perspective, basically all the works are in linear perspective. They have to be because this is what the public is demanding. We're looking at mimesis, to mimic nature, to replicate, to reproduce the natural world around us. And in order to do that, realistically, we have to know all about three-dimensional space and linear perspective. Second, just by looking at the room, it looks like a real room. And thirdly, again, mathematically, we can prove it. We have a horizon line, a vanishing point, and all these lines, parallel lines, and the technical term for that, although I don't use it that often, is orthogonals. And this is from the coffered ceiling up above, the tops of the doorways to the left and the right, and you can even see the edges of this table are slanted in such a way that their horizontal lines, or excuse me, their orthogonal lines uh, meet at that single point, the vanishing point. Boston Common at twilight. 
again, a work that's in linear perspective. Even though the, the perspective here is kind of hidden, we can see that the trees themselves are placed in a straight line. The same thing with the park benches, the edges of the walkway, the side of the street, the trolley cars, and even the balconies of the buildings all line up to a single point in the distance, the vanishing point. Here, the vanishing point is slightly off to the left, and this work is in um, diagonal recession. And you can also tell when it's in diagonal recession because the work is not going to be able to be symmetrically balanced. We have more of a compact industrial area with people off to the left and a much more open park-like landscape setting that is off to the right. Now what we've been studying so far is one point linear perspective, meaning that there's only one vanishing point. What happens if we add a second vanishing point? All of a sudden we can twist and turn scenes, again making the world that we're creating much more natural. So again, you can totally see the different in types from one point to two point perspective. We have a lot more capabilities. In Standard Station here by Ed Ruscha, we can follow the architectural lines down to a point right here at the bottom right hand side of the canvas. Off to the left though, the image is going to be off the scene. So it's going to be probably several inches off here to the left. But again, all those parallel lines are still meeting at a point called the vanishing point. And here we know this is going to be true because we can see a little bit of the horizon line right here. And this is definitely a part of the horizon line. It gives us a very unique view of this gas station. And Ed Ruscha was obsessed with this image. He would paint it during the day and at night. He'd even paint it on fire. And then this one here he called the double standard. So looking at Paris Street on a rainy day, this envelops all the things we've talked about already. Scale, objects closer to us appear larger than those farther away. The scale of these people is large, smaller, smaller yet, so they're further away. We talked about overlapping. This person here overlaps the person next to him. Vertical location, look at where these people are standing here, well below the ground line. Here, higher up, higher up, higher up yet. And then we have this building in the background that we can absolutely prove it's in linear perspective and two-point perspective because we're seeing this building at an angle. If we were seeing a very frontal scene like The Last Supper, that's always going to be in one-point perspective. But anytime we see a building at an angle, that's going to be two-point perspective. Now things get worse. When you add three or more vanishing points, then all of a sudden we have what's called multi-point perspective. And you don't need to know that for this class, but you just need to kind of realize that it does exist. Now the horizon line is only strong enough to hold two vanishing points. And this third vanishing point is usually above or below the line, causing us to see some very high heights and some very low depths. The types of images that it's going to create are images like this by M.C. Escher, and he was a master of using multi-point perspective. And I will also tell you the art world shuns this guy. And even though his works are really interesting to look at, he was never really embraced by the artistic community. And I think one of the reasons for that is because truly this guy was not an artist. He was a math teacher. And of course, with linear perspective being nothing more than a mathematical equation, this was like perfect for him. So we're going to move away from some of the technical accomplishments of the 15th century and move back into some art. This is the Orsan McKelly, and this building has been at the very heart of Florence for centuries. It is really where economic, art, civic, and religious life kind of blend into one. This site has been a convent, various churches, 
a granary, and today it's a museum where you can go inside and see the original sculptures that were along the outside niches. The sculptures outside today are replications of the originals. But back in 1339, the 14 most powerful guilds in Florence were assigned the job to fill in these niches with their patron saint. And there was a lot of pressure on the guilds to get this job done. So they would go out and contract with the most notable artists of the day. When you first walk into the Orsan Michele, you're basically in a church. And this is one of the altarpieces that you see at the far right of the screen that is in situ. So this is an altarpiece that has been in its original location since the 1300s. Keep in mind when we look at these sculptures, their dimensions may seem a little bit off. And the reason that is, is because when we're walking along the street, the artist has to know that we are going to be looking up at these. They start at about the six foot level. So we're going to be looking up at something at a very unique angle. This sculpture was commissioned by the Wool Guild. And it's made out of bronze, so when we think about bronze, we think about money. This sculpture is over eight feet tall. And when it was created, it was the largest sculpture in Florence. No one had ever cast a sculpture out of bronze this large in centuries. And so, of course, the person who creates this, the person who gets the commission is Ghiberti. He is currently working on the doors of the baptistry at the same time. This is one of the side jobs that he did. How much faith did the guild have in him? Absolutely none. In fact, the contract, which still exists between the artist and the guild, states that if Ghiberti couldn't produce this sculpture, the guild owed him no money for the expense of materials or his time. One of my favorites is this one here, which is Four Crowned Martyrs by Nani de Banco. So this artist is able to fit four smaller sculptures into this niche. This was produced for the Stone Carvers and Woodworkers Guild. So of course these are, this is a sculptor's guild that you would belong to if you were a sculptor. The images represent four sculptors who were executed for refusing to make an image of a pagan god during the Roman era. So they're standing in this semicircle as if they were conversing. And there's not enough room in the niche. And you can kind of see the ones on the edge. They kind of surpass the niche and come out into our world. Verrocchio is an artist we'll talk more about in the next lecture because this is the teacher of Leonardo da Vinci. And along with Ghiberti, Verrocchio was among the best of the bronze workers of his age. It's also kind of cool because this is a sculpture where we have one figure in our space leaning in, touching the wounds of Christ. When this sculpture was originally removed for safety reasons during the bombings of Florence during World War II, we found out that the sculpture of Christ is completely backless. It is a hollow sculpture and it's basically almost like half of a sculpture. So it really rests with how talented this artist was. Now we don't have any documentation that da Vinci helped on this commission, but da Vinci's definitely, as we speak about him in our next lecture, learns a tremendous amount of bronze sculpting techniques from Verrocchio. And then we have Donatello's St. George. This is one of three sculptures that Donatello created for the outside of the Orsan Michele. This one commissioned by the Armorers and Swordmakers Guild. And this sculpture would originally have had a sword and a helmet made out of bronze stolen centuries ago. The sculpture is made out of marble, very Romanesque in appearance. And the predella, which is that image underneath the sculpture, sets the narrative. And particularly with this sculpture here, we can see the elongation of particularly the shield and the figure itself. So had this been six foot up in the air, we would have been able to see it in a much more realistic 
view. Now Donatello is the most noted for creating this sculpture here. And this is not from the Orsan Michele. This is a sculpture from the Medici family's courtyard. The family them itself was very close with this artist. And Donatello, unlike other artists who normally passed away by the time that they were 40, this guy lived well into his 80s. Also very distinguished career in terms of sculpting with bronze. And this is the very first time that we have a life-size freestanding male nude sculpture since antiquity. And I want to say that again because it's so important. This is the first time in a thousand years that we have a freestanding male bronze nude sculpture. Donatello himself was very much associated with past techniques. Now when we look back at sculptures from the ancient Egyptian era, we can see how solid they are, how unmoving they are, even though they have one foot in front of the other to kind of give that illusion of motion, they're still very solid and unmoving. What makes the sculpture at the left so lifelike? That's the ancient technique of contrapposto. So contrapposto was invented during the Greek Empire and one of the sculptures that really resonates with that technique is Hermes and Dionysus. And you can kind of see the weight shift that takes on here, where the hips are kind of jutting out off to the left, and you can kind of have this line crossing the abdomen, kind of going from the upper left to the lower right. Opposite that, we have a line going from the shoulders from the upper right to the lower left. And what that does is it creates and by the definition, it's the position of the figure in which the hips and legs are turned in a different direction than that of the shoulders and the head. So it's that weight shift, and it makes sculptures much more dynamic and lifelike. After the fall of the Roman Empire, we lose this technique, and Donatello is among the first to bring it back and of course, this opens the door for Michelangelo in the next century as well. We have a much different version of David than we're used to, particularly with Michelangelo's version. We have a younger boy type figure, probably around the age of 12 or 13. He has long curly hair. He wears a bonnet. It has laurel leaves around the edge of the bonnet. This is one of the symbols of the Medici family. And even though we don't put much stock in the fact that this version of David could beat Goliath, we're also entering at a different part of the story where the battle has already happened. And here we have the severed head of Goliath underneath the foot of David. As you saw in the movie Medici Godfathers of the Renaissance, this sculpture would have created an extreme amount of controversy if it was put on public display, but it was not. In fact, we really don't know quite when this was cast. All we have are the inventories of the Medici family, and this showed up on an inventory list and said it was out in their courtyard. This was a private sculpture for this family. Now you've got, the reason it created controversy is it had that feather extending from the end of Goliath's helmet, caressing the inside of the leg, which would have been viewed as a homoerotic element. This is a great compare and contrast, so I would expect to see it on some type of exam. We have completely different versions of the sculpture itself five foot two inches at the left, 17 feet at the right. The medium is bronze at the left. And when we have bronze, we think about money. It's 10 times more expensive to make a bronze sculpture than a marble sculpture. We have different points of the story. We have a much older version of David at the right, a much more manlier version. We still have that technique of contrapposto being used. We have the line going across from the lower left to the upper right, but in the hips, they go down from the upper left to the lower right. 
In the century after Michelangelo, we have what's called the Baroque. This is a much more active sculpture, and we'll talk about Bernini and his creation in a later lecture. And because Donatello lived so long, he was able to produce a tremendous amount of artwork. So we have a much earlier version of David, probably about 40 years earlier. The next building I want us to take a look at is the Santa Maria del Carmine, also in Florence. And when we look at Renaissance churches, the way they're constructed is pretty much like a cross. And we're here at the very base, walking into what's called the nave, and this is where the congregation is going to sit. Where you can't see, that's kind of blocked by these buildings here, is that there is a crossing or transept. And this is where a lot of the more private chapels, the wealthier family chapels are going to be. If you were extremely wealthy, like the Medici family, you would even have your chapel in your own home because the church wasn't, let's say, as sacred as it is today. You could easily be assassinated in church. So at the Brancacci Chapel here, this is where we have some beautiful fresco paintings done very much in the style of the Arena Chapel by the artist Masaccio. And Masaccio, if you remember just from a few moments ago, was the artist who first utilized linear perspective in painting with the Holy Trinity. On the left-hand side of this wall, this upper image is called the tribute money. And the tribute money is one of those really groundbreaking images that we can look at that really substantiate all the techniques learned in the 15th century. The story goes Christ and the apostles arrive at the city of Capernaum and they're confronted by a local tax gatherer who demands a half drachma tribute. Since they don't have any money, Christ directs Peter to go to the Lake of Galilee, where he finds a fish with a coin in its mouth, and he's able to pay the tax collector. And so all those scenes, all that narrative, happens within that painting. And what it is, it's a complete departure from Giotto's work of just a century before. With Giotto's work, look at the way that the buildings are constructed, Look at the general flatness of the scene. We do have some emotions, but we don't have any shadows. We have a lack of a light source. Even the figures themselves are fairly two-dimensional. As we move into Masaccio's work at the bottom, all of a sudden we have techniques such as chiaroscuro, which I'll talk about in just a moment. We have atmospheric perspective in the background. We have linear perspective in the building at the right. All of these conventions are part of the 15th century. And look at the shadows as well, cast by these figures, because now we have a light source in the upper right-hand corner. So we have a complete departure from Giotto's work of only a century before. And that's mainly why the 15th century is so important in the techniques that artists are able to learn. Now, I just gave you the term chiaroscuro. This is a technique in which the artist manipulates value, and value is how light or how dark an object is, in order to give the illusion of three-dimensionality. In other words, it's the gradual shift in light and dark values to imply depth and volume. In fact, chiaroscuro is the Italian words for light and dark put together. And of course, it was invented during the 1400s. So this is what's called a chiaroscuro sphere. And you can see in the upper right hand corner of the sphere that we have a light source. We have very little shadowing. And then we have this gradual shadowing. It gets darker and darker. And then we have a, a very much a dark edge around it where it hits the background or the table that it's sitting on. Here's a little bit better of an image to show you the highlight and the shadowing. And also below here is our value scale going from light to dark. And of course, white and black are the extremes of value. And by having that gradual value change, we create three-dimensional images such as this one here. And it happens very commonly 
particularly in black and white photography. One last artist we'll touch on before we do a little review is Botticelli. Botticelli is among the other artists who are very commonly utilized by the Medici family. And among his most famous works is The Birth of Venus. This is actually the very first time we have an artwork that is done on canvas. Up until this time, we're painting on poplar wood. And now this work is done on canvas. And the reason we think it was done that way is because it was going to be used as a flag or a banner in some type of processional. And once the artist started thinking about how great canvas could be utilized to paint on, we really start seeing that transition. Figure this is done around 1484. By the time we get into around 1505, about 20 years later, that's when we really start to see the complete shift over into canvas rather than using wood. And there it is in real life. And then we have the Primavera, also by Botticelli. And Primavera translates from Italian into springtime. And it is eternally spring in Venus's garden. At the very far left, we have Mercury dispelling some storm clouds out of the garden. And then we've got the three graces dancing here. We've got Venus in the center and her problem child Cupid up above. And then on the far right, we have Zephyr the wind god chasing Chloris. And when he catches her, she transforms into the goddess Flora. There are approximately 42 different varieties of wildflowers displayed in the painting here. And these are all wildflowers that are native to the Tuscany landscape. So let's do a quick review. We've got quatrefoil, which is the shape of these panels. The Medici family, who were extremely important in the production of art. They were the patrons of art during the 15th century, creating works such as Donatello's David, placing the dome on top of the Florence Cathedral, and even hiring artists such as Botticelli to paint the Primavera. They also led Florence politically. Contraposto is that weight shift in the body. You kind of see a little bit of that S-curve going on with the image at the right, but it's basically where the shoulders and head are lined up differently than the hips and the waist, giving a much more natural and realistic stance. Sculpture in the round, that's just a three-dimensional sculpture. It's meant for us to be able to view it from all sides. Scale. In this case, the scale is altered on the trees on the left-hand side. As they diminish in size, it literally leads us back into this painting. Overlapping, we have the bottle here, overlapping the bottle here, and so we view this bottle as being closer. With vertical placement, the higher the object is, the further back in the landscape it is. Atmospheric perspective, as forms recede into the distance, their contours become less distinct. The forms begin to take on the color of the atmosphere. We normally see that with a very cool and crisp foreground, very detailed. But when we look at the mountain range going from right to left, we lose track of if there's any mountains back here or if this is just the edge of the mountain range. The clouds and the snow are very similar in terms of value. So we have a lot of value contrast up here, very little value contrast in the background, and that's what makes atmospheric perspective. Amplified perspective is where we distort parts of the figure, but still convey the illusion of three-dimensionality. For an artist, it's very difficult to do, so you're not going to see too many of these types of artworks. Linear perspective is really what I want you to walk away from this lecture knowing. The idea that Masaccio was the first person to implement it into painting, although Brunelleschi was the one who codified linear perspective. He put the formula to it. He figured it out. The horizon line is where the vanishing point lives. The vanishing point is where all the orthogonals or parallel lines meet. So we have in the 
image at the right, all of the coffered ceiling lines meet right down at a single point called the vanishing point. We have chiaroscuro, which is the gradual change of light and dark values to convey depth and three-dimensionality. And in our next lecture, we're going to be talking about Italy in the 16th century. We're going to move away from Florence and we're going to be Rome and particularly St. Peter's Cathedral in the Vatican. So I hope to see you at that lecture.